Good morning, everyone. Welcome at a beautiful day in a beautiful setting in beautiful Paris. Our third day of Change Now. Three days about change, three days about inspiration, and this session will be about green hydrogen. My name is Ernst Hustra. I will be your master of ceremony. I will be moderating the sessions. We have three blocks for you today. The first part, we have a keynote by Stefan Serrat. He will lead us through some of his findings based on 20 years of research. Then we follow by a panel of Life and Gaia first. And we close it off with a fireside chat uh, with Mathieu Gardy. So we will have an exciting program for you. We cover different angles. All the things you always like to learn about green hydrogen, we try to cover today. We close it off an hour and 15 minutes from now, and then we really have a, a great inspiration. So we will uh, first listen to Stefan Serrat. He, has, he is the project lead with CEA. The CEA is the institute that drives a lot of innovation research in, uh, uh, in the domain of energy transition, the stuff that we really need to know for our future. He's leading those projects, and he will lead us through in the next 15, 16 minutes about his findings on tons of research. So without further ado, please welcome on stage Stefan Serrat. Thank you, Ernst. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to start this session based on clean hydrogen. Um, I will start presenting you a few slides about uh, hydrogen. Unfortunately, I forgot the, the click for changing the, the slides. <coughs> Thank you, Ernst. So we are talking about green hydrogen, and the idea is will green hydrogen will save the planet. It's a quite, uh, it's not a new topic. It's a hot topic, but it's not a new topic. Because uh, Jules Verne, which is a quite famous uh, French writer, uh, explained in uh, Mysterious Island, Lille Mysterious, 1874, that hydrogen should be a very, very relevant and suitable fuel uh, much more interesting than coal. So it was a, he had a vision, and I think we follow this vision. And uh, why? Because um, hydrogen is well known now as a possible key player in the decarbonization of our future, of our industry, of uh, housing, mobility, and so on. And um, the idea is to be able to manage renewable uh, sources and low carbon uh, production of, of uh, electricity in order to produce hydrogen. And hydrogen is interesting in terms of storage of the energy, of flexibility connected uh, mainly to um, renewable energy. We have to do that uh, in terms of decarbonization for mobility, uh, domestic issues and industry. We have to do that in a very accessible cost and uh, of course uh, taking into account all the environmental issues. So, in terms of industrial deployment here in Paris, uh, it's not a new topic as well. Because you have here a picture of the coal gasification plant around 1920, here located in Paris, for the production of city gas, gas de ville. And you can observe that the main, comp the main uh, constituent of this gas de ville was composed by hydrogen. Hydrogen for um, city lightning, for uh, district heating. So we have a quite large habit of using such kind of compounds. So in terms of key figures, what can you do with one kilogram of hydrogen? And one kilogram of hydrogen is roughly 11.2 cubic meter in terms of volume, at room pressure. 
If you apply pressure, 700 bars, therefore, one kilogram of hydrogen will be in 25 liters. And if you put that in a tank, in your car, for instance, then for one kilogram of hydrogen, you will need a tank of about 20 kilograms. That gives you the idea uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of volume. In terms of low heat value, I mean the capacity of one kilogram, if you burn one kilogram, therefore you will obtain 33.33 kilowatt hour. That's the maximum in terms of thermal energy you can recover burning one kilogram of hydrogen. And if you use a, um, a fuel cell in order to produce electricity, hydrogen, oxygen, and a fuel cell, you will produce electricity, heat, and water with a yield of 50%, so roughly with um, 16 kilowatt hour. Then, in your house, you have one to two days of self-autonomy in terms of electricity. I'm not taking into account the heat production, but for all the other uh, activities in your house. In terms of energy, one kilogram of hydrogen is roughly equivalent at one gallon of gasoline, 3.7 uh, liters of, um, of fuel. And then we'll be able, with a classical uh, car, you will be able to drive during 100 kilometers. And the, one of the main topic is the price of one kilogram of hydrogen. Now, with uh, steam methane reforming, which is an industrial classical way using fossil raw materials, it will cost about one to two kilograms, uh, one to two euro per kilogram. And with the new processes, for instance, using high temperature electrolysis, therefore the cost is about eight euro per um, kilogram of hydrogen. So you, you understand now that in my roadmap in terms of research and development is to increase the, uh, the, the efficiency of, the, of, our process, uh, of our process in order to decrease drastically the cost of one kilogram of hydrogen to be competitive with um, the actual, which is very pollutant way. So, the paradox of hydrogen. You can find hydrogen everywhere. But it's all, it does, it almost never native. You have to transform compounds to obtain hydrogen. And we've got here the three possible ways, fossil way, biomass way, and using water. You've got in bold what are the mature industrial processes. I talk about steam methane reforming, coal gasification as well, partial oxidation of heavy oil residues, in this case, you use fossil raw materials. And when you produce one kilogram of hydrogen by steam methane reforming, then you produce 10 kilograms of CO2. Okay? Though this is a very, very pollutant way. You can also use biomass uh, in order to produce uh, a hydrogen with steam biomethane reforming. And you can also use water. Uh, as uh, Jules Verne uh, <laughs> presented in uh, Mysterious Island, with water electrolysis, you take water and you split the water in hydrogen and oxygen, and therefore you can use that oxy uh, hydrogen, and therefore you need what we call electrolyzer to, uh, to do the job. So, hydrogen can serve industry, mobility, and uh, energy in the quite big picture. You've got here, oh, sorry. You've got here the picture with um, the, the, the first energy, the primary energy you can use. You understand that you have to transform compounds to produce hydrogen, therefore you need primary energy. This primary energy can be renewable, solar or wind, or it can be also fossil, nuclear, or uh, hydraulic energy. Then, one is base load, nuclear, hydro, um, fossil, and hydro. One is intermittent, solar and wind. And with the, uh, this electricity produced, you, uh, you feed the grid, and then with high electrolysis, you produce hydrogen. You can store this hydrogen in the bulk, 
and use the, this hydrogen for transportation, for instance, with fuel cell vehicles. You can inject hydrogen in the natural gas grid storage, and it's uh, an idea to have a mix in the future with um, natural gas and hydrogen in order to produce energy in terms of electricity in heat. And you also can use hydrogen, combining hydrogen and CO2, CO2 waste, then you will reuse hydrogen and CO2. Therefore, you produce methane by co-electrolysis that we call power to gas, hydrogen and CO2. You produce methane that you can feed in um, the gas grid storage and use as its equivalent, but in this case, you didn't use raw material from the earth, you use CO2 already available as a waste and you produce in circular way. So, um, in CEA, we develop uh, in France and in other countries, especially in uh, north of uh, Europe, in Finland, in, uh, in Poland, in UK, as well as in the US, Canada, and in Asia, mainly in China, the, um, the, the idea is to couple a small nuclear power plant, we call that SMR, small modular reactor, and we use such kind of l small reactor with a capacity of 300 megawatt electric um, to produce, of course, electricity and to produce heat. And because we have heat and electricity, therefore, we can use high temperature electrolysis, which is a process developed by CEA, and now uh, we, and it will be soon commercially available through the Genvia company, a joint venture we created with Schlumberger and CEA, to produce such kind of electrolyzer. And those electrolyzers have a very high efficiency in terms of yield of production of hydrogen. And of course, this um, system allows us to produce heat, to produce electricity, to produce hydrogen, and the hydrogen can be stored and given to the industry or for mobility, or you can use hydrogen if you need, in a peak of demand of electricity, you can use this hydrogen with a fuel cell to produce electricity. So the idea here is to have a system which is very flexible and the, that we can adapt uh, through the demand. So I will skip this one. I will finish with an um, example because, okay, I presented the theory, but we are in change now, and we have to change now. I mean, we have to accelerate, we have to um, promote the use of hydrogen in the industrial field. This is um, Jupiter 1000, which is a platform that uh, industrial partner and CEA created in the south of France, in Marseille, for sur mer which is a very heavy industrial area uh, with a, a large amount of, unfortunately, CO2 produced by, this, um, by the industry. So, with the CNR here, we have uh, the knowledge of producing uh, electricity with a wind turbine or solar panel. With uh, RTU, the French uh, company in charge of the electricity network, we produce electricity, and then we feed uh, with, uh, within McPhee, the company who provide alkaline electrolyzer or PIM electrolyzer. Then we produce hydrogen. And uh, with the available CO2 in this field, we combine CO2 and hydrogen to produce methane, and we inject that into the grid, and it's a very, very, very interesting application of producing either hydrogen or, uh, or methane in a very, very, very industrial way. You've got here the, the picture. In terms of hydrogen storage, you can see uh, the um, roughly the, the size. Another example, uh, sorry, yes, uh, will be explained by, uh, uh, by the CEO of LIFE, which is um, the way to produce green and renewable energy with a very, very interesting and uh, inspiring idea to connect the wind turbine and electricity pro uh, production with offshore production of hydrogen. And uh, that's uh, the life concept presented uh, uh, just after offshore energy. Uh, another very interesting application uh, connected to our, our life in Paris is the Hype company. And uh, the CEO is, will present as well the, uh, this company. The idea is to develop and to accelerate 
the promotion of hydrogen in both production, distribution, and use of hydrogen. That's uh, the main goal of HYPE. And the first use case uh, is connected with taxi, which uh, I live in Paris, so I know the importance of, of using taxi. And you've got here, uh, roughly, uh, they have 200 taxis, and they are increasing the amount of taxi using um, hydrogen as a fuel, uh, of course, with fuel station available uh, in, uh, in Paris, uh, Orly, Roissy, uh, Pont de l'Alma, I guess, so with increasing number of fuel stations. Oh, sorry. Another, and we finish with that, with Gianni, uh, will present uh, the very, very amazing idea to convert waste into energy. You know quite pretty well that we have a big issue with plastic in the oceans, and the, the idea of Gaia First is to develop a, a ship able to recover those plastic and using gaseification, onboard gaseification, to use those plastic as uh, raw material to produce hydrogen, and this hydrogen will fuel the ship, that, and this ship is in very, very short loop, short circuit, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, it will help us to go further. So I will conclude that, and uh, I, I just wanted to give you a few, sorry, few messages, and I didn't want to meet them. Uh, of course, I tried to convince you that hydrogen has to play a major role, a key role, in our strategy in terms of energy transition. We need what? We need a rapid implementation of national and European strategy in order to accelerate um, the fundings, of course, for research and, of course, for the development of new company. Um, Therefore, we need to invent new partnership between public and industrial organization to achieve this acceleration. And I just want to finish to say that in France, you will see that, and even in Europe, we have a very, very unique position in the field of hydrogen. And then we must be the front runners in this field, and we have, we have all the abilities to achieve this point. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. That was, uh, that was really inspiring, and, uh, and we learned a lot. Uh, I understand your organization has 2,500 researchers as well in, uh, in there, so it's also a very positive note that this, your institute has also uh, helped us to progress. But, and you ended up with a very positive call to action, right? So we are in the moment. Uh, we are, we're in the moment. We can do things in France. We can do stuff in Europe. What would you give to the audience as a tip from your presentation to move forward with uh, green hydrogen? Yeah, I think that um, it's time to change now. <laughs> That's the motto of this, uh, of this seminar. Uh, you will see very impressive application, concrete application. I've been working in this field for more than 20 years, 25 years in terms of research. And uh, my big frustration if we need hydrogen, we need uh, renewable energy, we need low carbon energy, but the transfer from research to industrial applications is quite complicated, especially in France. And though my main message is we have to decrease the time to market. We have to increase the link between deep tech and practical applications, and that's the only way to accelerate and to, and to face the issues connected to climate change. Thank you, uh, Stefan. So Everybody, a call, to a, a call to action. Support Stefan in his <laughs> endeavors. Let's make this a little bit more green. So thank you very much. Give a big hand to Stefan Serrat. So, as I said, after the keynote, we will do uh, a panel. And uh, I would like to uh, call on stage two distinguished guests Please welcome on stage Gianni Valenti and Antoine Hamon. Welcome, uh, gentlemen. Um, first, to, uh, first to start, maybe it might be a good idea that you, that you briefly introduce yourself 
about your current role and your organization, so we get a little bit of a feel what you currently represent and what your current role is. Gianni, would you like to go first? Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Gianni Valenti. I'm the president and founder of Gaia First. Gaia First is an international NGO um, focused on environmental matters. We are piloting a very large-scale ocean cleaning operation um, with ships uh, designed to collect and convert continuously plastic waste from the ocean garbage patches into green energy, especially hydrogen, green hydrogen. And we will use this energy to alimentate the whole process, as Stefan very, uh, Stefan very well uh, presented before, uh, in order to make this a self-sustaining operation, besides having also other positive impacts. Um, maybe, maybe we get to that a little bit later already, yes. uh, Gianni. Uh, thanks. Uh, Antoine? Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I'm Antoine Amon, I'm the deputy CEO of, uh, of LIFE. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, two years ago, uh, I was here uh, as a participant and nobody was uh, talking about hydrogen. N none, uh, none of the participants on the stage were talking about hydrogen and today we are even have a dedicated stage for green hydrogen and I think it's a very, very positive message and, um, and I'm happy to, to be part of it. And so in your, um, maybe to pick up on that one, huh? in your current role, you are the deputy CEO and, and, and CEO of, uh, of LIFE. Um, can you explain us a little on, on how the model of LIFE is to, and what are you doing with, uh, with green hydrogen at the moment? So the, our role at LIFE is to do exactly what has been explained before, is that to, to make hydrogen a reality, make green hydrogen a reality. So it was in the in the research um, environment for, for years, and now we need to, to put it on the front of the stage and to really deploy a green hydrogen production site. So our role at LIFE is to create these sites and to produce and distribute and deliver green hydrogen, so from renewable energy and water, so we have no emission from one end to the other, so we can use this green hydrogen into cars or into the industry and at the output of the car you only have water. So that's our goal and the, the long term or medium term development is to push this type of plant everywhere in Europe. So we have more than 90 projects going on right now uh, all over Europe to have the same type of plant in different Quantities. Maybe, maybe, maybe one step. So the, sure. you, you, you were talking about this, this value chain, and eh? they're talking about distribution. Yeah. But, but it looks like that you're sort of, uh, you're, you're, um, sort of orchestrating a little bit in, in, in this chain. But can you say a few things just to give us a view? When do you produce? Are you producing hydrogen, or are you just transporting it? Or uh, gives a gives a view on that. We so we are currently producing hydrogen and delivering hydrogen to hydrogen refueling station or industries that are currently using hydrogen or that want to switch from uh, natural gas to hydrogen. So that's something we currently do. And the good thing, and I, I want to jump on what has been said before, the good thing is that we have currently positive business case. So it seems that hydrogen is expensive. That's, that's what we hear here and there. But if you make the, the real calculation, including transportation of the hydrogen to the end user, if you add the cost of CO2, if you, add, if you really compare things with the, re, the same scope, mm -hmm. we have, even at the beginning of the green hydrogen story, we have a positive business case. And that, so, I think that's a good message to share. And, and then if you talk about a positive business case, yeah, that, that sounds really encouraging. Yeah. And then, but what type of case do we need to think about? But is there, I, thought, I saw on your site, for instance, there was uh, you're working with uh, municipalities mm -hmm. uh, to, to help them to, to go for that transition. So how would such a project start and how would that move forward? So there are, let's say, three big areas where green hydrogen can really kick off. The first is municipality where we can switch quickly buses, uh, garbage trucks, or, or all the mobility activities of a city with green hydrogen. And the beauty is that it can be locally produced and so you, you don't even have to import any, any energy from, from outside. You have your own you are the, the actor of your own energy. 
that's for municipality. You can do also another big sector is mobility. So you have heavy or light mobility, but you, if you take from boats, trains, uh, trucks, cars, everything can be switched to hydrogen. And the last one, which will be a big part, uh, it's more hidden, but it's a big part, is industry. All the industry that is currently using either hydrogen for um, all sort of chemical products or uh, natural gas for, um, for heavy industry like steel or glass, mm -hmm. they can switch to green hydrogen right now and decrease by more than 90 95% their CO2 emission right now. Great. So, and then, and effectively, the green hydrogen you actually support through your channel, put it into buses, garbage trucks, etc., to really give it practical examples. And, and, that, and that's happening today, as you say, right? Yes, that's happening today. So today from our plant, which is south of Nantes, in the west part of France, we are supplying hydrogen to a, a ref hydrogen refilling station, like the one we are, they are in Paris for the, for the taxis. And um, so you can go with your car, you can buy, a, like I see this nice uh, Renault car right there. So you can buy today a more Asian car like Hyundai or, or Toyota cars are available on the market. And you can go and fill your, your car. It takes like three minutes, like, like when you fill your car with, uh, with oil and you can drive around 700 kilometers with this. Uh, so it's yeah. practical today. And today you, it's cheaper to, to refill your car with hydrogen, green hydrogen, locally produced, no emission, than buying uh, oil for your car. So it's, it's concrete that, today. That's great. We will, we will elaborate on that a little bit further, but uh, uh, let's uh, also uh, go back to, uh, to Gianni, uh, because we were, we were also having a, a, a discussion about sort of, you know, how green is green hydrogen, right? So what is the difference? Because I can still drive a car on hydrogen, whether it's green or not, but can you give us a little bit on the staging? How do, how do you see uh, those, those, those different definitions? Well, hydrogen is still hydrogen. It's just the, the way to produce it that, that say, changes color or classification. <clears throat> so we start from uh, black hydrogen and we go to gray, brown, all the way to green. And green is actually the best way to produce it because it has uh, no CO2 emissions. This is how it's focused, how it's classified. Um, the way Gaia, <clears throat> Gaia First actually will produce hydrogen, it's in a way, uh, you could say it, it starts class as being classified as turquoise hydrogen because we're using a kind of pyrolysis system on plastic to extract the hydrogen. Uh, the only problem, well, the only problem, the advantage of this system is actually that we do not have any um, carbon emissions except for physical carbons, the carbon that we can actually use in the industry to make, I don't know, tires or to make graphite or even diamonds. Maybe, maybe, maybe just, to, just to give a view on, because we saw the ship that Se yes. Stefan was, was showing. Yes. What, has to, what does that have to do with your hydrogen? Well, the, the actual ship will be making hydrogen within the ship from the plastic waste. And this hydrogen actually will be used to feed the ship itself. So this means that the ship will be running on their own produced hydrogen, which means no emission whatsoever. Uh, and on top of that, the actual functioning of the ship, of cleaning the oceans, will revive the ocean's natural carbon uh, sink um, power because it will revive phytoplankton, which is the, the, a very functional carbon sink for the oceans. So it's, it's like replanting trees as we go and clean the oceans. That's great. So you're, you're making it greener than green, right? So if that would be the... I would say it's a super green hydrogen because we're actually, it's, it's a negative um, footprint, a negative carbon footprint that, other than zero. And, and I can imagine that then sort of, you know, people are dreaming about this that, and nobody thought it would be feasible, right? But somewhere you, you decided to take a plunge. Maybe, maybe you, you, were you always in hydrogen or in energy transitions, or how did this, how did this emerge to, to get Gaia first up to speed? Well, I, I've been in the, I've got a scientific background, but I've been in business most of the time, um, um, in business management, creation, and, uh, and, uh, and consulting as well. But what actually made me wake up in the situation, I've always been pro-environment, what woke me up was maybe during the last COVID situation where I realized that um, there is an emergency on 
on the climate, on the environment in general, and everybody knows that, but everybody's looking around, waiting to see somebody else taking the first steps. And so since I have, um, I've been always an innovator in things, and I've had the chance of meeting important people, for example, some Na NASA engineers that were working on a gasification system in space exactly for that. Um, I just put one and -on one together and I try to solve the equation uh, addressing more problems with one solution. But so I can imagine, so you have a dream and you want to create this yes. Uh, yes. And, and, and you decided to, to go for it. But there must be massive challenges, you know, with financing and, and you know, finding supporters effectively to, to, to share this dream, right? And, and I think also to, to the audience, it's also important to understand sort of, it's encouraging that you, came from, you, you have just have a business background and you can go for the, still for this domain. But what were the real challenges that you have faced over the past uh, two years in this? Well, challenges have been uh, support, financial support and organizational support. Um, because coming from a world that is not connect, directly connected to the environment or green hydrogen, um, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. But um, you have to go forward. And this is what I, this is my message to the people is that stop doing things for the sake of business, of just making money. This is why the, the association is called Gaia First because Gaia as being the, the goddess of, uh, of the earth in ancient uh, mythology, Greek mythology. We should put the interests of the planet first, which we will, we will all benefit from it. So uh, that's the message. Don't do, even if it's difficult, everything is difficult and everything can be, can be reached. And you can fail at something very simple. So it's better to go for something difficult and fail other than just not do anything at all. So my message is, go for it, and instead of just doing business for business, yeah. do put the interests of Gaia, of the Earth, first. It's right. your generation, not just everybody's generation. I can, I can relate to that, I guess, as well. Also, for next generation that, you, that you're doing this. Thing. But could we, and Antoine, also from your perspective, hey, you, you joined this company and this, this, this this new, let's say, um, uh, activity, no, fairly recent in a way. So what made you decide to, to jump into the green hydrogen uh, market? I think there's a lot of uh, connection. The, the DNA of life, when we created life a few years ago, was really to, to realize that there's something we should do for our children to save their future. Because the planet itself will, will survive after us, but the, the really one that are at stake are our children and uh, the children of our children. And, and I think we have a responsibility to, to do something. Mm. And as engineers or, or business uh, developers or whatever, we need to do something right now. And we know that the, 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 the wall is, is right here. And we have solutions. And they've been in the, in the research uh, cupboard for, for years and, and we need to put them in the front um, in the front place and uh, and make sure everybody can can uh, can afford to to drive with um, zero emission cars and to buy zero emission um, equipment and uh, yeah and, and to preserve the, the future and yeah I so so effectively also saying your your passion is driving this forward although you're not you don't need to be a top specialist in green hydrogen in order to make you know, to invent new business models because that's partly effective what you're doing right yeah ob obviously you have to be passionate to, to learn about it but since basically no one was knowledgeable about green hydrogen before you are we are creating the the knowledge and um, and all the actors and i think it's the case in green hydrogen but same in other fields that are here uh, on the on different booths we are creating a new, new technologies, new things to, to act now. And I think that's, uh, that's the key message. Key message is it, it's, we have a huge challenge, but we can do it now. And, and I think that's, that's what we, we try to promote and, and yeah. explain. And we all can, can uh, change the future. 
Yeah, thanks. But I think it's also encouraging in a way that you say sort of, you know, it's not only about change now, it's also about act now, right? So really take that in execution, right? Take that step forward. And it's, it is possible, as you're saying. So maybe and, and I think it's important to also explain that we are in a step-by-step -step process. So right now, as I was saying, we have a first factory that is producing green hydrogen, but we need to increase this capacity to be able to, to deliver green hydrogen and to replace fossil fuel. Because we talk a lot about electricity, Electricity is only 20% of the energy we use. Mm -hmm. So we have a huge challenge to decarbonize the 80% remaining. And so we need to, to do step by step. And there's a lot of, of um, I don't want to say haters, but a lot of talks about scratching the, the, the surface of small problems. But, but the, the, the strong message is that we are going to the right direction. And we are increasing the size of the green hydrogen plant. And as the picture was showing earlier, we, at some point, we will have some limitation on, on the land to, to produce renewable energy mm. because we can't have wind turbines all around Paris. But maybe, maybe you can, uh, just, to, uh, just to give that a little bit uh, uh, structure in, in a way for, you're saying that you as a company, uh, obviously you have expansion plans and you would like to grow, like any traditional company likes to do. So it's also encouraging that still business metrics apply to uh, uh, an environmental, uh, let's say, company in there to a certain extent, right? Sort of, can you say a few things on, <coughs> let's say, w w what would be your, your upcoming projects or plans that you currently work on? Yeah, we, we need to be a sustainable business to be sustainable for the, for the planet. Mm -hmm. So we need to have a sustainable business. So we have a pretty good news because we finalized our IPO, so we will be on the stock market as, as soon as uh, next Monday. So it also proved that uh, we have an um, interest for capitalization to, to come to the company and to help to, to provide solution. But I'm fully aligned with what was said, that the main target is to decarbonize. That's the main target. And so to do that, we need to speed up the deployment process. And for that, we need funds and we need to have positive business case. But we, we need to speed up the development process and to massify the, the production of green hydrogen. And that's yeah. where I wanted to go to. At some point, we will need to go offshore because that's where we have unlimited water and very, very stable and very powerful wind. And so that's what we do also to look at the future. And we will massify and reduce again the cost of uh, green hydrogen by going offshore. And as soon as this summer, we will have a first offshore electrolyzer that will be running and producing green hydrogen offshore. And that is the next step to the, to the very big spread of uh, green hydrogen uh, everywhere. Yeah, that's that. So working on your capital structure, having a nice pipeline of new projects, evolving, and probably it's also experimentation, right? So because you're not 100% sure whether it works out, but you still apply the same attitude of innovation in your company for the future project. So but maybe let's move to Gianni as well in, the, in this domain, because obviously offshore is probably close to your heart, right? And, uh, and I can imagine that there are, are certain things where you want to, uh, uh, what are you planning for in the next, let's say, period to come with Gaia first? Well, the first part, the first uh, step stones is actually the finalizing the research and development and design phase, which will be finished by the end of December, after which we'll be launching the, the adaptations of the ships and the launching and the off operations on the sea. Uh, after which, actually, there is, um, it will be a business case um, because we will open different markets. We will open markets from waste management at sea, uh, hydrogen production at sea, um, hydrogen refueling, uh, as well as support to coastal areas. And in the end, um, also preparing systems that could work both efficiently, both on sea and therefore on other boats, as well as on land. So transforming what we have, the mountains of trash that we have today, mm -hmm. into mountains of valuable energy. But you, you're, you're, not, you're, not on the, you're not on the stock market, or not yet on the stock market, maybe. Eh? You're an NGO still. So. Yes. How would that work then also uh, for the funding? Because I can imagine this is, this is massively expensive uh, projects. You need a lot of capital to do so. How do, you, how do you organize yourself in this? Well, the first stage is because we are an NGO right now. So the first stage is actually to finance the, end, the, the, the research and development phase, which is uh, 750,000 euros. Uh, we are talking, we've just started um, the, uh, the, the, the search for the funds. <laughs> 
So we, uh, we are already talking to some uh, companies that are dedicated already in the sea and they know exactly what's happening and the need uh, to, uh, to decarbonize transport and also to re, uh, rehabilitate you know, the ocean in climate control, biodiversity protection and health. So it, it's a very wide spectrum action. This uh, is the NGO part. Once this is done, we are obliged to go into a business case unit because um, just the, the, the general management of the, of the ships uh, require um, investments, taxes, and that an NGO cannot hold. And there is also uh, space for venture capitals to come in. Great, great. So, and I, I would just like to, to uh, change the, the, the structure or the, 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 the angle a little because we're living in a very volatile uh, world at the moment, right? Sort of in, in terms of, we see the uh, geo, we're just coming out of uh, COVID, uh, we're in a geopolitical uh, turmoil uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, we see a, a big effect on, on, on energy uh, pricing, right? So does that, to what extent does that influence uh, your activities in, with, uh, with developing green hydrogen? And it's a question to both of you. So, so this is a real, really bad situation that we are facing. But I think it put the light on the real sustainable projects. Um, and green hydrogen is, is one of it. So we had the first, uh, after COVID situation, re we realized really as a society that uh, we need to do something and to go to real, to invest, to, to, to restart the, the economy in Europe or in France, to invest in sustainable projects and not in the oil and fossil projects. So that, that was a good first step for green hydrogen. And now with the Ukraine crisis and, and war, it's, we realize that we need to have also uh, our own independence in terms of, of energy and that, uh, that is possible, <laughs> it's possible with, with uh, green hydrogen. And, uh, and so we saw that a few days ago, Europe issued a new plan to target to have 20 million tons of, of, green, of green hydrogen or hydrogen in the next years. So that's unfortunate that as a human species, we need crisis to realize and, and to act. It's unfortunate, but at, right now we have the crisis, so it's really time to act. Yeah, and, it, and I think you were alluding to sort of, hey, the, the, the stories, the distribution, some of the stuff can be off-grid, right? Sort of, uh, you have different type of ways that you can actually distribute the energy. Um, so becoming less depending on, let's say, the, uh, the carbon, uh, the carbon uh, uh, realized energy. Gianni, would you like to elaborate on this? Yes, I, he's, uh, Antoine is correct on the crisis. Unfortunately, we need the crisis, yet, uh, there was the Paris Agreement uh, six years ago uh, stating the urgency to um, deviate from fossil fuels and ever since we've been spending uh, the important the, the main banks have been spending uh, the equivalent of uh, 4.6 trillion dollars ever since in new fossil fuel plants just uh, 750 billions were spent last year in 2021 so it's it's uh, unfortunate that there is this uh, war crisis in, uh, with Russia and the Ukraine, but actually, hopefully, it's, uh, it's a good opportunity to deviate uh, the interests of the markets from fossil fuel to hydrogen, which is a much more responsible uh, way. So, yeah, thanks on that one, because it also shows that there's a paradigm shift, right? Sort of, and, and it's with unfortunate events, but we know that events will occur anyways, sooner or later. Um, I, I would like to sort of, you know, sort of try to try to uh, sum up what we try, uh, what we what we just elaborated on. And we also recognize that government and policy making is not always the answer to the problem. We really need the spirit and the entrepreneurship of companies like yourself to actually act to address the challenges that we uh, that we face. And that green hydrogen is an area where we see massive potential. And you're just showing that by being in business only for a few years, changing careers to go into this domain. And I think that has been really inspiring to me to understand that it is, you know, the world of possibilities that you're describing. Uh, I find it fascinating and, and I really would like to uh, thank you a lot for, uh, for sharing those insights. Uh, with us today. Um, 
So please join me and give a big hand to our two uh, speakers here in the panel. Thank, Thank you. you, Gianni. Thank you, Antoine. Thank you, guys. As you can imagine, it's a little bit warm here on stage, so uh, I'm not sure where the green hydrogen is going to help us. What I do know is that our next uh, uh, guest speaker will be also uh, showing us that there are real practical examples of how you can apply green hydrogen. Who is, uh, who is uh, who's familiar with the, uh, with, with the Paris taxis here? Yeah? I like to drive a taxi, right? So be, because it gets you the convenience. But what if that can also be powered by green hydrogen or by hydrogen? So without further ado, please welcome on stage the CEO and founder of Hype. And uh, here is Mathieu Gaudi. Yeah. So you made already 20 cents today. That's good. Johnny, if you lose, uh, if you have lost uh, 10 cents, we found it, right? Mathieu, welcome, welcome to the stage, and uh, and it's uh, and it's honor and pleasure to have you here on stage. Maybe we can start with sort of uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about the company uh, it, um, as we uh, as we see it. it. We know it's it's a hydrogen taxi company, but tell us a little bit what you uh, what you're currently doing. Um, thank you, Hans, and I'm very happy to be, to be here today with you. Uh, effectively, Hype is uh, quite known today as a, a taxi company, and you can effectively uh, use uh, an hydrogen taxi today in Paris. Uh, uh, you can uh, download the uh, Hype app and, uh, and book a taxi. Uh, but the Hype project is a bit more uh, global. It says a taxi company in Paris is a visible uh, portion of the project, and the project is really to give to, de to deploy as soon as possible a global uh, integrated mobility platform that will integrate production of green hydrogen, distribution of green hydrogen, and also the first uses. And we consider that taxi activity is a very interesting first uses, first business case for uh, hydrogen and for hydrogen mobility. So we focus on these first markets, and we created the first customer for this market, which is a taxi uh, company hype. Uh, but we then going to, to scale up and address the world market of taxis uh, in various cities and also address other uh, markets of mobilities and at the same time deploy our own network of uh, production of green hydrogen and distribution of green hydrogen. Great. So, so let's, let's break that down step by step because that's already a lot of information. So let's, um, but let's take one step back because you don't start a company like Hype overnight, right? So when did you start this company? And what, what was the trigger for you actually to start this company? Uh, effectively, our Hype is today more the brand. The company was created in, uh, in 2009, and the name of the company was Step. Uh, and the idea be behind that was to address uh, one issue that I was personally facing, which was uh, the air pollution and the noise pollution uh, that we are facing as citizens in cities like Paris. So Paris is a beautiful city. Uh, you probably uh, all appreciate that, but it's also very polluted, a very noisy uh, city. Um, myself, I'm not coming from the taxi industry, I'm not coming from the automotive industry, not from the energy industry. I was in a consultant and then in a finance business, uh, but I live in Paris for some 30 years now. I've raised my four children in Paris, and so I've clearly been facing the issues with uh, uh, respi respiratory uh, diseases, mm. uh, notably for children or for old people. And so I'm very um, aware of these uh, public health issues with uh, air pollution and noise pollution. So I wanted to find solution for the main polluters in cities, and in fact, taxis are one of the main polluters in cities, to rapidly switch to a zero emission solution. Okay, so, so you're saying sort of we, you already started in 2009, and you got your motivation as well partly with the, uh, with the pollution, right? So, and we all feel that. So, but then it doesn't automatically bring you to, okay, let's start a taxi company uh, on, 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 on hydrogen. So when, when did sort of, you know, what was, the, what was that trigger point that gave you the sort of the, the courage to actually go for it? Um, let's say the, the taxi was 
identified as a main polluter in cities. So the first fleet that should switch as soon as possible to their emission solution. Uh, from 2009 until 2014, we tried to launch that with the battery electric vehicles ecosystem. So with only 100% battery electric vehicles and fast charger networks. So again, an integrated platform, but with, uh, within the battery vehicle uh, ecosystem. And we didn't succeed. We failed for various reasons. It was difficult. We didn't launch any car on the streets. And in 2014, um, some Asian car makers announced the first industrial series of uh, fuel cell electric vehicles. So we switched to hydrogen ecosystem because hydrogen was clearly a very interesting solution, technical solution, fun functional solution for us. And we launched uh, Hype uh, during COP21, six years ago, seven years ago now, uh, with five first cars and the first station uh, in the center of Paris. But, but again, fr from the very beginning, the idea was how can we identify a solution and put that solution uh, at scale in order to help the taxi drivers and other urban mobility to switch as soon as possible to zero emission solution. Great, so, and but still, uh, it's still very capital intensive, I can imagine, because the cars are very expensive, the infrastructure is very expensive. How did you, how did you get to the financing in, the, in this? Yeah, so b back on my stuff, I, I came from the, 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 the banking industry and the finance, uh, so this was not the, the main uh, issue for me. Um, my, my view that was that at some stage you can have business cases locally that make sense and you can attract capital and attract uh, 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 private money. Um, um, so effectively, it's quite capital intensive. Uh, but if you do have a business case, or if you do have a vision, and if you are flexible in being able to, ad to uh, adapt your vision, then you can attract uh, uh, money. Okay. And I think we have very, very interesting uh, experience in France now. Typically in the hydrogen world, now there's a lot of money that search for interesting projects. So do not worry too much about money. Money will be there if the project is there. OK, but so it's, it's, it's very encouraging. So with with the vision eh, that you could display, you could actually move ahead and you find your financiers, banks, grants, maybe local, uh, local subsidies that, that enabled you to, to, to partially execute on this one. Yeah, let's say, um, well, the, the project itself was designed to be able to uh, be bankable. Yep. Uh, so we do not rely on subsidies, but we organize also ourselves to, 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 to benefit from subsidies because it helps. Mm -hmm. But the business model itself should not rely on subsidies because if you rely on subsidies, you will not control the timing of what you want to do. So you need to yeah. control the timing of your vision and uh, their, uh, relying on subsidies is not, uh, is not very uh, cautious. Okay. So, but Mathieu, sort of, uh, um, by the way, if you look at, uh, look at on screen, I'm a happy client already, uh, as you can see. So, uh, so thanks for that. Um, so, um, Macho, to, to break it down a little bit, is, is this also sort of, can, you, you, were, uh, you were mentioning already mobility as, as a bigger market, right? Is that, is that going to be your next step? Or are you, are you planning to expand with more cities for the, for the taxi market? In which direction you feel it's most, uh, most appropriate to go for? Uh, we will go uh, somehow in all the directions. <laughs> uh, so typically for Paris, because Paris is a very uh, interesting place to, to start. Uh, to start with, so we have great ambition in Paris and we'll um, benefit also from the specific milestones that we have with the Olympic Games in 2024. So our objectives for uh, the summer 2024 uh, is to have 10,000 uh, taxis uh, that should have switched to uh, zero emissions thanks to hydrogen and thanks to the platforms that we are building. Um, we will, uh, by this, uh, this date also, uh, deploy a network of 26 stations in Paris uh, area, mm -hmm. uh, delivering uh, the uh, daily capacity of uh, 20 ton of hydrogen per day. Uh, and we will use this network of stations to uh, facilitate and accelerate the arrival of other mobilities. So last mile deliveries, heavy duty buses, uh, uh, waste, etc. So we create the conditions for all the various operators to effectively quickly switch to hydrogen, and we are really focusing on what will happen between now and 2025. When you're discussing about looking of, about hydrogen, everybody's talking about 2025, 2020, 30, 2030, sorry. 
we really focus on what's happening now and tomorrow and try to make things happen in the very, very short uh, time frame. So there's a, there's, a, there's a big ambition, right? So yeah. what, what are the main challenges that you're currently facing to, to really make sure that these plans can be deployed? And, and sorry, I'm back on ambition sure. to finish on that. At the same uh, reason of 2024, we uh, plan to deploy HYPE in 15 uh, additional cities or region uh, in France, Europe, and uh, North America, which are the first targeted uh, uh, regions. Uh, so increasing in Paris and, uh, and uh, at the same time deploying in other, in other cities and regions. Okay. And, and so what are the main challenges in, in, in getting this massive sort of, you know, expansion going? Um, I think m most, some of the challenges are now behind us, so that's a good news because when we started six years ago, we started with five cars, uh, five first adrenaline taxis, and it was the biggest fleet in the world meaning that we are really starting from zero, uh, and it's difficult to start from zero uh, in an environment that is not waiting for you. Uh, so we are now very happy with the great focus that uh, is uh, now uh, on hydrogen. Um, uh, so the challenge will be to uh, continue uh, the growth uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we have one big challenge, which is to keep on convincing car makers to accelerate, keep on convincing the industrial as a whole to accelerate. Uh, there's a portion of it that we will do ourselves. I was mentioning the fact that we will deploy our own network of station, our production capacity, etc. We are not making cars so far. Uh, we need to use the cars that exist. So for the moment, we have uh, we have uh, Asian cars, and uh, we are very happy with that. We are very happy that uh, our friends from Renault are now uh, proposing some. Uh, some uh, new uh, offer in a, in a short term, but this short term is not short enough. No. I mean, you sh everybody should go and see Renault and say, okay, that's very great, your car, but we need it next year, not in two or three or five years. Yeah, so what you're saying, sort of, you know, we want the, the, the industry, the automotive industry, needs to speed up their pace on, on, on developing more cars. Well. Correct, and it's very difficult because it's very difficult to be a car maker today. Uh, this industry is. Uh, facing major challenges, uh, so we have to identify the ways to help them. Uh, so show them that there are some interesting market for them, show them that there are paths that are not too risky, that, that will make money, make it a business model, uh, and benefit from a global alignment, from political vision, uh, political support, industrial reindustrialization of Europe, uh, and the link with, uh, with final customer, with market. And um, you, were, uh, you were earlier telling us about sort of, hey, you moved also from electrical powered vehicles to hydrogen powered, right? Sort of what, is, uh, what are the benefits for, for hydrogen versus electrical? Uh, I think hydrogen is, uh, is very interesting when battery is not, meaning that you really need to see things as uh, complementary solutions with other type of solutions and ultimately you have to find the, the good product for the customer. Uh, battery electric vehicle can do a lot of things, it cannot do anything and it should be questioned uh, the idea of increasing the size of the battery, increasing the, the, the power of uh, fast charging etc. At some sense really doesn't make sense for various reasons. So hydrogen is relevant when battery is not anymore and ultimately uh, our idea, our vision is you should mix and optimize the two systems. You can optimize them within the vehicle, which is uh, what is uh, proposed in the prototype from, uh, from Renault. So it's a, fuel, it's a full uh, electric vehicle, one single engine electric, but with two uh, power systems, one small, uh, reasonably sized uh, uh, battery, rechargeable, and one fuel cell and hydrogen. And so you have the best of two worlds. And I think we should have the same vision on um, infrastructure. I mean, it's probably not, we, we will not succeed in increasing the numbers of charging points, increasing the, the power of charging points, etc. We have to think about optimizing the various network, and hydrogen is a solution uh, for the scale up of, uh, of uh, charging points. So, all right, so, so yeah, you give us the benefits, or it might be a dualistic type of thing. So, and obviously, this today we talk about green hydrogen in a way. How do you see that being, you know, uh, also uh, uh, further developed? And is that is that a key thing for you as well as uh, as hype to uh, to to adopt or to elaborate on? 
but, well, the, the, the worst thing behind that is, of course, to decarbonize and to decarbonize mobility energy. So hydrogen will have to be green. And gray hydrogen is a nonsense, even if it's efficient from the public health uh, mm -hmm. perspective, it's a nonsense from a, from a carbon perspective. So we have to go clearly toward green hydrogen. But we also have to be pragmatic. Uh, I think the key point is to change and to make things change now and not wait for the perfect solution and the perfect business model and the perfect technical aspect, etc. So let's move now with what is available uh, with a clear vision, a clear direction, and this direction has to be green hydrogen. But we need to use renewable energy. We need to use, in some cases, perhaps nuclear energy. We need to use what is available to make things change now. And would you see sort of we seeing stuff uh, happening also with politicians, right? Sort of we see policy making, we see happening, we see that happening also in uh, yeah. Please go uh, <laughs> go out of the sun. But the uh, uh, we see also the European Commission come up, up with an action plan. Is that good enough, or um, what would be your take on that? Well, I think it's never good enough, but we don't ask the politicians to be at the forefront of what we do. We need to be at the forefront of what we do, and we need the politicians to follow it. In the hydrogen world, I think it had been helpful, the situation of the, the European Commission, because it was, when you are a friend guy, uh, I mean, in France, we were really uh, way behind. So we mm -hmm. used European fund, we used uh, European initiative to start what we did. Yeah. Uh, but we don't have to wait for that. We have to explain what they should do and create the condition for them to do it as soon as possible. Okay, so um, that, is, that, is, that is interesting. Eh? You say the industry is leading that versus, versus what is happening in the, in the, in, in the policy making to a certain extent, at least from a practical point of view, you are already adopting the rules that are still need to be written probably. Is that, is that what you're saying? I, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about the industry because it's very difficult to be an, an, an industry player. We have the, the chance to be newcomer, mm -hmm. uh, agile, uh, we do what we want. We have to use this energy to make things change, and then the industry will follow, and then the politicians will follow. Okay. So, and, um, and, and in this, we, we, we learned from the other speakers as well. Uh, they are also in the same domain, but much more, let's say, also in the distribution and, and production. You are more in the application of, of, certain, uh, of the certain modeling. How, what, what are key partners for the ecosystem to really, uh, to really you know, fast track this energy transition? Uh, well, we focus first on use, but we are also on production and distribution. I think we need to do, try to make things move and team up with people like us, I mean pure players. People that really want to make, change, to make things change quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's not necessarily the case for big industrial players today, because they have to transform themselves, they know it but uh, it will take time, and it's not, sincer, not necessarily uh, an, an emergency for them. Uh, so I think the best way to, 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 to accelerate things is to uh, team up with pure players like us, which have share the same objective of, uh, of development, uh, of developing uh, quick uh, and massively. Okay. So, and then the, so this, this is also the partner structure. And, in a company, if you want to grow this fast and having so many, uh, uh, let's say, projects ongoing to, to run that expansion, um, you can run also in the trouble of you know, finding the right uh, people on the bus, as they, as they say, sort of within the team that you need. Sort of how do you attract talent to a company like yourself and what has been, you know, what type of people you would be looking for to, to support you in the next, uh, in the next endeavors? Yeah, that, that's a very important uh, part of the project. We do assume to have a very specific uh, social uh, part in our, in our projects. We have, uh, uh, at the beginning of the project, we, we uh, worked only with salary drivers, typically, uh, with permanent contract, and those drivers are, uh, benefit from a stock option plan, so they are in line with us in the interest in, uh, in the success of the company. Um, regarding the, let's say, tech aspects and everything that is related to hydrogen, there will effectively, be, I believe, be a great tension on the availability of uh, qualified resources. Uh, our um, main, uh, I mean, what we have in our hands is uh, the fact that we are at the forefront of it, uh, so we are moving faster than the other. Uh, so the people, they contact us because they know that we, we, they will learn before the other, uh, if they are part of this project. 
Yeah. So I think we attract them uh, by being the pioneer in what we do and keeping uh, that in mind. And, and is it a little bit like yourself, because you also had a background in finance, for instance, you're looking for uh, you know, uh, more the spirit than a specific uh, uh, skill base, or what type of talent would you be uh, happy to attract? Well, we are uh, looking for any type of, ta of talents because uh, we have a huge, uh, uh, we have a huge uh, objectives and we need a lot of people, uh, but we also need a specific mindset, probably. <laughs> Uh, we are not looking for stars, to be clear. We are looking for people who share the same view as us. We're happy if they come. Uh, if they want to leave, they will leave. Uh, so we are trying to create the conditions that where they will be happy within this project and they will somehow uh, appropriate themselves th th the project and want to go on with us. Um, so I believe that a lot of people uh, that we can find by, with, uh, with, uh, with those, uh, those characteristics. No, and, and, and I love your sort of that, that you sort of try to be inclusive with your staff with regards to also, uh, you know, sharing on the equity. And how would that work? For a, is that only for the drivers or would that also? No, no, no it's for the whole team. But uh, in our team, we say we have the driving team and we have the non-driving team. Uh, so but it's everybody is part of the team and the same and it's uh, the same team. Okay. Great. So, uh, well, thank you for, for sharing all of this because you are on a journey and, and a little bit an evangelist, or you have been, and you're still sort of continue the ride, right, with sort of with, uh, with a huge level of ambition to make hype a bigger hype, right? Um, I'm just using the word, right? Sort of, but I, but I think that that, that is what you're trying to uh, trying to tell us. So, what what be be sort of final words for you also to this audience? for uh, the, the, the call to action? Uh, call for action is uh, probably, we, we are trying to create the condition for things to happen, and things will happen also in the customer way, in the customer hands. So you are, in various aspects, customers. So you can make choice and decide what type of product you will select. And I think that's everybody's responsibility to, to select products that will help us to change things in the, in the, in the right direction. Well, I, I couldn't uh, tell it more beautifully, uh, Mathieu. So uh, uh, thanks a lot um, from <laughs> Mathieu Dadi. <laughs> thanks a lot, uh, Mathieu. That has been uh, uh, super insightful. So we started off today by saying, so we want to learn a lot about green hydrogen. Who did learn? I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how it's being structured, what are the benefits and what are, what are the structures that we can see ourselves. Stefan led us through what are the key developments for uh, uh, renewable uh, energy sources and typically uh, the green hydrogen. We learned from two uh, uh, executives on their businesses, how to generate and how to distribute and how to make it more tangible from Antoine and Gianni. And we finally closed up with the real business case, with hype, something that you can see on a daily basis. What does the connect that all together is that nobody knew that it was totally feasible, but they dreamt it, they vision, they got their people engaged. They came from different industries in order to help us to make green hydrogen a success. They put their own time, efforts, money into this one to make their dream become true. So there's real entrepreneurs needing to make that change. So support these guys in anything that you can do today. The call to action that we hear from everyone, make those little steps in order to become greener. Adopt and uh, be aware of what uh, green hydrogen can do. We're not there yet. It's a journey. It's super fascinating. We need the talent and we need the brains of all of you in order to make that successful. So thank you all. Excellent panel. Thank you all for being here today. Have a great day.